that the Honorable Minister Edwards Chairmanship has chosen the right focus at the right time. Trade within the continent as well as with the rest of the world has a crucial role to play in accelerating sustainable economic growth across Africa. As we know, the global economic context is difficult. Despite the resilience they have shown in the face of recent shocks, many African economies are struggling to cope with tight financing, high borrowing costs, and debt pressures. A few weeks ago, the IMF lowered its 2024 growth forecast for Sub-Saharan Africa by 0.4 percentage points to 3.7%, mainly due to a 0.2 percentage point downward revision to the growth outlook in Nigeria after the first quarter. The forecast for next year is 4.1%, still below the average for emerging markets and developing economies. More trade and value addition are necessary to create the better jobs that our young people urgently need. Greater regional economic integration will contribute directly to these ends. In addition, the large and unified market of 1.4 billion people, represented by the African Continental Free Trade Area, would help turn the continent into a stronger base for producing for global markets and for attracting investment, including from other African and developing economies. This would help African economies sustain higher growth and foreign exchange earnings in the years ahead. But the road ahead is long. According to UN data for 2021, only 13% of Africa's goods trade was intra-regional, compared to 21% for Southeast Asia, 39% for the US, Mexico and Canada, and 60% for the European Union. Africa accounts for only about 3% of global goods trade and an even lower proportion of global services trade. To realize the full potential of intra-African intra trade integration to drive growth, we need to lower trade costs across the continent. And that is why the Africa Caucasus focus on facilitating intra-African trade is so tiny. Estimates by WTO economists suggest that African businesses currently face trade costs equivalent to a 354% tariff, which, are, which is among the world's steepest, and one and a half times the level in high-income countries. For intra-African trade, the costs are one-fifth high, equivalent to a 435% tariff. IMF research estimates that implementing the reductions to tariff and non-tariff barriers foreseen in the African continental free trade area would increase the medium merchandise trade flow between African countries by 15% and boost medium low per capita GDP by 1.2%. The projected gains, gains become even bigger if accompanied by improvements in the trade environment, for instance, to transport and telecommunications infrastructure access to finance, and domestic security. Medium merchandise trade flows among African countries could rise by 53% and trade with the rest of the world by 15%. The per capita real GDP of the median African country would rise by more than 10%, putting a serious dent in extreme poverty. Implementing the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement and the new Agreement on Investment Facilitation for Development would help African countries create a more supportive environment for intra-African trade and investment. The WTO is also working with the World Bank to improve digital infrastructure in several African countries. The bank is bringing funding for building out the hard infrastructure, while we are bringing expertise for the soft infrastructure, that is, the regulatory side. Another set of reforms deals with labor mobility. I hear anecdotes suggesting that even the continent's biggest business people, uh, uh, businessmen like Aliko Dangote, struggle with visa requirements when doing business across Africa. For smaller businesses, the obstacles are frequently insurmountable. With effective trade reforms, I believe the continent could be poised for an era of stronger and more sustainable growth with regional and global trade playing important propulsive roles. Let me give you three reasons why. First, in an aging world, Africa's growing young population offers the workforce and the markets of tomorrow. Second, even as goods trade has slowed down, services remains a bright, bright spot 
and global trade, especially services traded digitally over computer networks, digitally delivered services. These sectors allow the continent's tech-savvy young entrepreneurs to leave from bad roads and ports, provided hard and soft digital infrastructure are good enough. And third, the current push for supply chain diversification in the wake of pandemic and other disruptions creates a window of opportunity for greater investment in Africa. More investment on the continent for regional, continental, and global value chains would deconcentrate the production of key supplies, making production and diffusion more resilient. At the WTO, we are calling this process re-globalization, and I want you to retain that word, re-globalization. We believe it can simultaneously help boost growth, job creation, and supply resilience. We are already seeing re-globalization happen as companies and add suppliers to reduce costs and diversify risks by installing production facilities in places like Vietnam. But instead of making this a plus one process, that is China plus one, China plus Vietnam, or China plus India, we need investment to spread further, say to include countries like Nigeria, Kenya, Morocco, Rwanda, and so on. Why not? These dynamics are bolstered by Africa's abundant green energy potential, which makes the continent an attractive destination for investment in energy-intensive sectors, including the production of green hydrogen. In fact, we have already seen Microsoft and G42, the UAE's top artificial intelligence firm, join forces on building a $1 billion data center in Kenya, powered by geothermal energy. There is much more scope for Africa to leverage such green comparative advantage, where countries specialize in what they are relatively green at. The low carbon transition and related demand for necessary critical minerals offer opportunities for African countries to attract investment to build up processing facilities locally. This would create jobs on the continent whilst helping to mitigate the risk of global supply bottlenecks arising from the current high degree of concentration in critical minerals processing. If processing can be powered by green hydrogen, the environmental dividends will be even greater. And African youth will be gainfully employed in Africa rather than risk their lives crossing the Mediterranean trying to get to Europe. Excellencies, let me now conclude. The Africa Caucus is well positioned to champion macroeconomic reform across the continent, serving as a bridge between the IMF and the World Bank and African governments. At this meeting, you have assembled the full panoply of actors needed to make a serious push to facilitate intra-African trade. Doing so would unleash the power of trade to grow the African economy and improve the lives of people across the continent. I wish you well in your efforts I want to assure you that the WTO Secretariat and I stand ready to assist you in any way we can. Have a good meeting and thank you. This timely meeting that is leveraging African trade central to Agenda 2063, but also for financing for development and the means of implementation. Boosting trade between our nations has long been an aspiration of our region and the AFCFTA roadmap. The past four years of global economic crisis have underscored the importance of this task today. Multiple shocks have left economies scarred, facing meager growth prospects and in desperate need of economic development to rescue the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2063. The COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and regional conflicts have exposed the vulnerability of global supply chains, including those that are essential such as food and medical supplies. Policymakers are now left to contend with how to strengthen their economy's resilience. Meanwhile, the multilateral response to global shocks has been both inadequate and highly unequal. That has prompted calls across Africa for our countries to work together, to draw on our collective strengths rather than rely on distant partners whose commitments are not always honored, particularly in times of crisis. These imperatives accelerated development, stronger resilience, and deeper regional cooperation make the case for deepening intra-African trade compelling and urgent. 
over the next two days, we will have the chance to discuss many strategies for supporting intra-Africa trade. One is trade facilitation. An estimated $9 billion in additional trade can be unlocked through liberalizing trade on the continent, as envisaged under the African Continental Free Trade Area. Yet, we could unlock at least five times that volume by addressing other non-tariff frictions, streamlining and digitalizing border procedures, harmonizing regulations, and investing in transport corridors. Nigeria's recent launch of the Guided Trade Initiative under the ACFTA demonstrates this country's commitment to the strategy. A second strategy to support regional trade is by nurturing a pan-African payment ecosystem. This will require a holistic approach involving multiple systems and stakeholders. The Pan-African Payment and Settlement System is one such example. Conceived by Afriexim Bank, working in partnership with central banks and private banks, it provides a foundation to facilitate significantly greater volumes in cross-border payments across our continent. A third strategy is bolstering access to energy and connectivity. Installed electricity capacity in Africa needs to be increased at least fivefold, and most of this increase can come from the continent's abundant clean energy resources. To, re to realize this goal, African countries have to put in place bankable just energy transition plans. When matched with investors, such efforts can not only facilitate trade, but power broader economic transitions that accelerate development and deliver across sustainable development goals. I'd like to commend our African leaders for working together to pursue these strategies, which have the potential to turn the promise of inter-Africa trade into a reality. But we must also recognize the formidable challenges facing African ministers of finance as they pursue these and other goals. Progress on trade facilitation, payment infrastructure, and energy all hinge on public investments. Yet today, developing countries face scant fiscal space. The global funding gap for the SDG investments alone is a staggering $4 trillion a year. The international financial architecture, which is intended to drive international capital where it is most needed, has proven unable to fill this gap. In fact, the funding gap is growing bigger over time. The World Bank, alongside other multilateral development banks, can play a critical role in making investments more affordable by providing low-cost, long-term funding and de-risking private investments. The recent joint commitment by the World Bank and the African Development Bank, working closely with the Sustainable Energy for All in initiative to connect 300 million Africans to electricity before 2030, provides a powerful example of what we can do together. But to plug the financing gap, we need these banks to be three times their current size. To their credit, the multilateral development banks led by the World Bank have embarked on a bold reform. This includes stretching their balance sheets to enable greater volumes of lending and providing more efficiency in the delivery of those volumes. Such efforts are welcome, but ultimately the MDBs will require general capital increases if they're to reach their required size as recommended by the G20 independent expert group. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we also need desperately action on debt. Today, public investment opportunities must not only compete with each other, they must compete with debt service too. Last year, an extraordinary 48% of government revenue in sub-Saharan Africa alone was devoted to meeting debt payments. It is painfully obvious that such levels of debt service are unsustainable. And that without action, without action any increase in MDB lending will not yield development dividends, but simply be diverted to hungry creditors. Resolving today's debt crisis requires mobilizing systemic support for countries where debt overhang is stifling SDG spending. At, a time, at the same time, we must build a new architecture that enables countries to borrow with confidence and invest in the future of their nations. Finally, we must strengthen revenue generation. Boosting public investment depends on it. That requires action from governments, but let us be clear, the promises our countries have made to mobilize domestic resources have not yet been met. They must be reinvigorated. But in today's globalized economy, domestic resource mobilization cannot occur in a vacuum. 
international cooperation is critical for effective taxation. African leadership has made the case that tax cooperation requires approaches that work for all countries and in which all countries have a voice. Now we have the promise of a framework convention at the United Nations to shape and to strengthen the future cooperation. African leadership was critical in initiating this process and it remains critical today in guiding the negotiations of an outcome that can win the backing of the global community. Excellencies, African Ministers Finance have played a vital role in placing these issues on the global agenda. I urge all of us to collaborate in delivering that change, particularly over the next 18 months. This window of opportunity at the Summit of the Future in New York in September, the annual and spring meetings where we must have delivered on the IDA commitments at $105 billion, the G20, COP29 and next year's fourth international conference on financing for development. This agenda is too important to ignore. The protests that we have witnessed in this country and in others are a response to persistent cost of living crisis that is rooted in global economic turmoil of this era. The importance of our African economies must take center stage. It's time to tackle the root causes, and much of that lies in the international financial architecture. Access to our economies must be had to long-term concessional funding. Others have had it, and it is Africa's turn to be given that right to grow and to prosper for its people. We have the opportunity to drive change, and by doing so, progress towards a vibrant and sustainable future. But this time, one that is determined by the African narrative. So as we work together to boost into Africa trade, let us also challenge the current international financial architecture that is not fit for purpose and demand that it responds to the needs and aspirations of the continent and its people. The rebound is commendable. We're happy that African economies are showing some resilience despite the challenging global economy. Having said this, our ambition is to consistently grow at 7.8% per annum in order to lead our people out of poverty. To achieve this target, this expectation, we must come together across the divide for shared solutions to critical challenges that impede the development and progress of our continent. In the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, 2024 must be our year of rebuilding trust and restoring hope, unquote. Dear brothers and sisters, having missed out from really benefiting from, the, uh, um, from globalization, Africa must now position itself to fully participate in the ongoing, what we call the 3D reset, demographics, deglobalization and decarbonization are reshaping the global economic landscape now. We must decipher where the opportunities are and determine what investors are looking at as they allocate their resources, as they allocate their capital assets, particularly the private sector. The demographics of Africa present tremendous economic potential that must be cultivated to take advantage particularly of intra-African um, trade opportunities and to transform and develop our economies and our region. African growth must and should be embedded in human capital, functional infrastructure, and strong institutions. Your Excellency, um, distinguished colleagues, the overarching theme for this year's 2024 African caucus is facilitating intra-African trade, catalyst for sustainable development in Africa. This theme, is, this theme is germane, it is pivotal as we collectively seek to accelerate the transformation and development of our dear continent. In the next couple of days, we will talk about strengthening the Pan-African payment system. 
trade facilitation, infrastructure, energy access, and um, digitalization, energy access. We are very, very excited by the initiative of the World Bank and the African Development Bank to bring electricity to 300 million Africans by the year 2030. And um, we look forward to playing our role to make that laudable initiative a reality. We also look to leveraging on our partnerships with the multilateral development banks. And finally, discussing IDA 21 replenishment. And let us speak with one voice as Africa. We want $105 billion. That is the target. And let us rally round a common figure so that we speak with one voice and make clear our request. We have also included a session on UN financing for development. And so we look forward um, with a splendid cast of um, facilitators, speakers, panelists to a very robust discussion. And the strategic issues of common interest that we agree on here over the next couple of days, including what we discussed yesterday, um, this caucus's conclusions and recommendations and requests will be communicated in a memorandum to the heads of the Bretton Woods institutions at the upcoming World Bank IMF annual meetings in Washington, D.C. Your Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Cape Verde, Mr. Olabo Abelino Garcia Correa, our host, the Chair of the African Caucus, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister for the Economy, Mr. Wale Edun, and I want to use him as my point of reference to recognize and appreciate the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria and my colleagues in the Federal Executive Council. Distinguished African Governors of the World Bank and the IMA President, heads of African regional organizations, and Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, permanent secretaries, directors general, and other heads of extra ministerial agencies and parasitals of government, my Lord Boateng, our honored keynote presenter, thank you for facing your African past. But it is worthy to note that our finance minister also has Ghanaian connections. <laughs> His wife is a Ghanaian, and when he was asked to choose between Nigerian and Ghanaian jello rice, he plays the role of a politician. He is a technocrat. He opted for Amala with Iwedu as a compromise meal. Former senior officials of government, elder statesmen, and captains of industry, distinguished delegates, members of the fourth estate of the realm, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to Abuja. Thank you for coming to Nigeria. Again, the backdrop of what happened a couple of weeks ago in Kenya, there was understandable apprehension. But here we are. No matter how long the night is, it must give way to the light of the dawn. Stormy. The weather might well be, but it won't rain forever. We have crossed the Rubicon. The president took the painful bullet. Reforms are inevitable. And we know the consequences of unveiling a masquerade. We are aware of the oil subsidy cabal. But your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are determined to push on, of course, with the milk of human kindness. We appreciate our heart goes out to what our countrymen are going through on course of living crisis, but we shall overcome. 
Once again, I wish to most sincerely thank my friend, Dr. Edwin Yerente, for the vote of confidence on the Nigerian nation fund, for all the delegates for gracing this function. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. <laughs> on behalf of President Bola Ahmed Tinibu, I'm delighted to welcome so many esteemed personalities who have traveled from all over Africa and all the regions of the world to be present at the important meeting in our capital city, Abuja. Today we gather as one family, united in our quest for a stronger, more prosperous and more peaceful continent. As we meet, we must also remember that our continent faces numerous challenges across economic, humanitarian, and social spheres. However, I take consolation from the fact that we all recognize the potential we possess to overcome these challenges. And we are ready to take the necessary measures to translate our immense opportunities in natural resources and human capital into growth, innovation, and collaboration. This caucus offers a vital platform for us to share experiences, forge partnerships, and chart a collective chart power. Africa's story is one of resilience, creativity, and hope. Indeed, we have made significant strides in recent years with many of our nations achieving remarkable economic growth, social progress, and political stability. Yet, obstacles such as increasing poverty, rising debt across many countries, inequality and conflicts continue to widen the gap between our continent and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. This is indeed a matter of serious concern. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this caucus meeting provides us with the opportunity to examine and discuss the main challenges and strategies for fostering inclusive growth and sustainable development in Africa. By ensuring that democracy, good governance, and economic institutions work together, we can improve the quality of life of people across the continent. I find the theme of this year's African Caucus meeting, facilitating intra-African trade catalyst for sustainable economic growth and development to be very strategic. It not only draws attention to the potential of a robust and inclusive global trading arrangement to accelerate growth, but also reminds us of the urgent need to address the unevenness in trade growth, which accounts for the weakening dynamism and openness in trade. With seasoned professionals and policymakers from diverse backgrounds in our midst addressing a range of timely and important issues related to Africa's development, I am confident that this meeting will pave the way forward for sustainable development on the African continent. As a government, we have initiated bold economic reforms aimed at steering our economy away from the downturns caused by multiple shocks in the global economy towards a path of recovery and resilience through significant economic transformation. Our reform efforts have been strategically focused on fostering fiscal and monetary efficiency, driving sustained long-term economic growth, and catalyzing job creation in alignment with the SDG's priorities. We remain committed to optimizing our economic potential delivering favorable outcomes for our citizens and ensuring the overall sustainable development of the regional economy. Our efforts are yielding positive reports, results would improve macroeconomic stability and increase investment. We believe that Africa has much to gain from further regional integration, structural reforms, and purposeful coordinated engagements with the international community. This will allow the continent to achieve the development traction it desires. We recognize that our individual successes are intertwined with the global economic landscape. Therefore, it is crucial that we collectively discuss in candid and dispassionate terms the imperative of advancing reforms of the international financial architecture to address systemic inequalities and promote equitable growth. We need enhanced international tax cooperation to combat illicit financial flows 
and ensure that multinationals contribute purely to our economies. We must also foster global economic cooperation to tackle the shared challenges and leverage opportunities. However, we must also acknowledge the need to take responsibility for our own development by undertaking the difficult structural and fiscal reforms required to boost long-term growth and enable reinvestment into our economies through infrastructure and effective social spending. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my sincere wish that this caucus will be filled with lively and productive discussions. We will undoubtedly learn from one another by exchanging valuable viewpoints to foster the needed shared growth, shared opportunities, and shared global responsibilities. I want to align myself with the position of Lord Barton that the future belongs to Africa. We are the youngest continent. The average age of the Nigerian nation is 16.9. We hold potentials, but we need to translate those potentials into realities. According to Con Perry, a global consultancy output, there will be 65 million global talent deficit by 2035. The United States, Brazil, and Russia will suffer from 6 million talent deficits each. We are in a unique position to take advantage of our useful population and fill in this gap. India, the global outsourcing powerhouse by 2035, will have only one million surplus. As I said earlier, Africa is a young continent. Our proximity to Europe is an added advantage, coupled with the fact that there are more English speakers in Nigeria than in India. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the highest we have ever earned from the exports of oil in Nigeria was 35 billion in 2011 under former President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan. India is expected to earn over $100 billion from outsourcing alone. I hope that you all will find the next few days to be an enjoyable and rewarding experience. Thank you so much. Excellency, all those on the front row will join. Other ministers of the Federal Republic that are here will join. This is just the first photograph. The Deputy Prime Minister of Cape Verde will join. AU President's representative, Secretary General of